Lauren had $80 in her savings account. When she received her paycheck, she made a deposit, which brought the balance up to $120. By what percentage did the total amount in her account increase as a result of this deposit? This is a percent increase problem, and there's a formula for that. The formula to find a percent of change is to find the amount of change, divide that by the original amount, and then multiply that amount by 100. And the reason you multiply by 100 is because when you divide, you'll get a decimal answer. And to change a decimal to a percent, you multiply by 100. Or simply move the decimal two places to the right. So first we need to find our amount of change. The amount of change is found by subtracting the two amounts. So she started at $80 and her balance went up to $120. So the change is 120 minus 80 divided by the original amount. So what she had in her account before she made her deposit, the $80. And then we multiply that by 100. So the percent change is 120 minus 80, 40, divided by 80, times 100. To simplify this, we can first cancel a zero. So we have 4 eighths times 100. And 4 eighths can be simplified to 1 half, or since we want to change it to a percent, 5 tenths which again is equivalent to 4 eighths or 1 half. So we multiply that times 100. This is our decimal, but we want a percent. So multiplying by 100 simply moves your decimal two places to the right. And we have to fill this empty seat with a zero. So it's 50%. It was a 50% increase, answer A. Kyle bats third in the batting order for the Badgers baseball team. The table shows the number of hits that Kyle had in each of seven consecutive games played during one week in July. What is the mean of the numbers in the distribution shown in the table? Well, the mean of a set of numbers is the average. And to find the average or the mean, you must add all of the numbers together and then divide them by the number of numbers there are. So first we'll add all the numbers together. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 1 plus 1 plus 4 plus 2. Then we divide by the number of numbers there are which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So we divide by 7. And again, this is how we find the mean. Add the numbers together and then divide by the number of numbers there are. So that is 1 plus 2 is 3, 3 plus 3 is 6, plus 1 is 7, plus 1 is 8, plus 4 is 12, plus 2 is 14. So 14 divided by 7. And 14 divided by 7 is 2. Therefore, the mean or the average of these numbers is 2. Dorothy is half her sister's age. She will be three-fourths of her sister's age in 20 years. How many years old is she? We have two unknowns here. We don't know Dorothy's age, and we don't know her sister's age. So I'm going to make up two variables for this. I'm going to use D 
for Dorothy's current age. And I'll use S for the sister's current age. And I say current because they're talking about um, their ages now and then also their ages in 20 years. But what we want to know is how many years old she is now. So we're going to deal with their current ages. So first we have that Dorothy is, and is in math means equals. It's one of my favorite words. I love the equal sign. So Dorothy is, Dorothy equals half her sister's age. So half S. So it's kind of like translating. You're translating from words into mathematical equations. The next sentence says she will be, so Dorothy, will be three-fourths of her sister's age in 20 years. So Dorothy in 20 years will be three-fourths of her sister's age in 20 years. Remember that D and S were Dorothy and her sister's current ages. So when they talk about in 20 years, that means we have to add 20 to their current age. So Dorothy's age in 20 years, so plus 20, will be or equals 3 fourths of her sister's age also in 20 years. So we want to solve for Dorothy's age, obviously, um, and we can do this in lots of different ways. But the first thing I notice is that since I know that D is one-half S, I can replace D in this equation with one-half S, and that's called substitution. So that's the method I'm going to use. I'm going to replace D with one-half S plus 20 equals three-fourths times the quantity S plus 20. Well, from here we have lots of options for solving. And the first thing I think about is, um, really I just want to get rid of this fraction, this three-fourths. So I think I'll start by distributing the three-fourths to what's inside my parentheses. So I have one-half S plus 20 is equal to three-fourths S plus, and then with the three-fourths and the 20, I can put 20 over one, and I can simplify multiplying these numbers by cross-canceling four and 20. I'm simply multiplying two fractions together so I can use this shortcut. I'm gonna divide both four and 20 by four. 4 divided by 4 is 1, and 20 divided by 4 is 5. So 3 times 5 is 15. 3 fourths of 20 is 15. That makes sense. Okay, so we need to get all of our variables on the same side. So to do that, I'm going to subtract 1 half s from both sides. 1 half s minus 1 half s is 0. I'm going to bring down 20, and that equals. Now, to subtract fractions, I have to have common denominators. So 1 half is also 2 fourths. So I'm going to change 1 half to 2 fourths so that I can subtract these. And then when I subtract, you just subtract the numerators. 3 minus 2 is 1 and your denominators stay the same, 1 fourth s, plus 15. Next, I need to subtract 15 from both sides. 20 minus 15 is 5, and 5 is a fourth of the sister's age. So finally, I need to multiply both sides by the multiplicative inverse of a fourth, which is 4 over 1, or just 4. So multiply both sides by 4. 4 times 5 is 20, 
and 20 is her sister's age. A fourth of four is one. So we're left with S, the sister's age. Well, remember that Dorothy is half of her sister's age. So since we now know her sister's age is 20, we know that Dorothy is half of that, and half of 20 is 10. So that means Dorothy is 10 years old. You could have solved this also by just kind of playing with the numbers, playing with the answers, and seeing which ones would work with the information you were given. But I always love to solve a good algebra problem. Rachel spent $24.15 on vegetables. She bought two pounds of onions, three pounds of carrots, and one and a half pounds of mushrooms. If the onions cost $3.69 per pound, and the carrots cost $4.29 per pound, what is the price per pound of mushrooms? So first, I want to figure out how much money was spent on the onions that were $3.69 per pound and how much was spent on the carrots that were $4.29 per pound. So let's start with the onions. Those onions cost $3.69 for every pound that's purchased. And she purchased two pounds. So we need to multiply $3.69 times two to find the total amount of money spent on onions. So two times nine is 18, carry the one. Two times six is 12 plus one is 13, write the three, carry the one. Two times three is six plus one is seven. Two numbers bind the decimal, two numbers bind the decimal. So that means she spent $7.38 out of her total on onions. We're going to do something similar to find the total amount of money spent on carrots. So next we'll deal with our carrots. The carrots were $4.29 per pound. So $4.29 times 3, since she bought 3 pounds of carrots. 3 times 9 is 27, write the 7, carry the 2. 3 times 2 is 6, plus 2 is 8, and 3 times 4 is 12. Two numbers behind the decimal, two numbers behind the decimal. So she spent a total of $12.87 on carrots. And um, so now I'm going to find the total spent on onions and carrots. So that means I'm just going to add these two values together. So 1287 plus 738. Make sure that when you add or subtract decimals that you line those decimals up. So we can go ahead and bring that down right now. 7 plus 8 is 15. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 7, 9, 10. So that means she spent $20.25 on the onions and carrots. And that, knowing that, will help us find out what amount was left to be spent on the mushrooms. Since I know her total spent on all of the vegetables is 24.15. I can take that total and subtract $20.25, which was spent on onions and carrots, and what I'll have is the amount of money she spent on the mushrooms. So again, we line up our decimals. Five minus five is zero. I can't take two from one, so I borrow from the four. It becomes a three. Then I have 11 minus 2, which is 9. Bring that decimal down. 3 minus 0 is 3. So she had $3.90 to spend on mushrooms. But what we need to know is what the price per pound was, which we can find using this information. She bought 1.5 pounds of mushrooms. 
So we need to take the total amount spent on mushrooms and divide that by how many pounds of mushrooms she purchased, which was one and a half or one and five tenths. Now we need to move the decimal one place in both of our numbers, so that's where it is now. And 15 goes into 39 two times. 15 times 2 is 30. Subtract and you get 9. Bring down the 0. 15 goes into 90 six times. 15 times 6 is 90. Subtract and you get 0. So no remainder. But we can add a zero here since we're talking about money. So that means that the mushrooms were $2.60 per pound, which is answer A. Jamie had $6.50 in his wallet when he left home. He spent $4.25 on drinks and $2 on a magazine. Later, his friend repaid him $2.50 that he had borrowed the previous day. How much money does Jamie have in his wallet? So the first thing I'd like to do is find the total amount of money that Jamie spent. And I see that he spent $4.25 and $2.00. So to find the total amount of money he spent, I need to add $4.25 plus $2. And it's very important that whenever you add numbers with decimals or subtract numbers with decimals, that you line up the decimals. So now I'm ready to add. And I can just bring my decimal down before I even start. 5 plus 0 is 5. 2 plus 0 is 2. 4 plus 2 is 6. So now I know he spent a total of $6.25. And if he spent that much money, then that's money that is taken away from what he had. So he started with $6.50, but he spent $6.25. So I have to subtract what he spent from what he had before. And again, we need to line up our decimals. I can't take 5 from 0, so I'm going to borrow from this 5. It becomes a 4. And now I have 10 minus 5 is 5. And 4 minus 2 is 2. I can bring down that decimal. 6 minus 6 is 0. So that means after he spent the $4.25 on the drinks and $2 on the magazine, he only had 25 cents left. But his friend repaid him $2.50, which means his friend gave him $2.50. So that's money that's added to his total. So now I'm going to take what he had after he spent his money and add the money his friend gave him. And again, we line up our decimals. 5 plus 0 is 5. 2 plus 5 is 7, bring down the decimal, 0 plus 2 is 2. So after spending money and getting repaid money, he now has a total of $2.75, which is answer D. A combination lock uses a three-digit code. Each digit can be any of the 10 available integers, 0 through 9. How many different combinations are possible? In this probability problem, there are three independent events. Independent meaning they don't affect each other. So to find the possible outcomes, we would have to find the product of the possible outcomes for these three independent events. So, the possible outcomes would be first the possible outcomes for the first digit, 10, since there are 10 available numbers, times the possible outcomes for the second digit, which again is 10, 10 integers, 
times the possible outcomes for the third digit, which is again 10. So the probability is 10, or the, the possible outcomes is 10 times 10, which is 100, times 10, which is 1,000 possible in outcomes. This is the quicker way to do it. Of course, you can always see by actually writing the combinations. 0, 0, 0 would be the first. Then 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 3, 0, 0, 4, 5, 6, etc. All the way up to 9, 9, 9 which makes it seem like there are 999 possible outcomes. But really, we have to count this first one, the 0, 0, 0, which gives us the total of 1,000 possible outcomes. Kyle bats third in the batting order for the Badgers baseball team. The table shows the number of hits that Kyle had in each of seven consecutive games played during one week in July. What is the mode of the number shown in the table? Mode means the number that occurs the most. So out of these numbers, one occurs one, two, three times. Two occurs twice. Three occurs once. And four occurs once. So the number that occurs the most, or the mode, is the number one. Determine the midpoint of the line shown in the figure. We will use the midpoint formula to find the midpoint of this line. The midpoint formula is x1 plus x2 divided by 2 and then y1 plus y2 divided by 2. So what you're doing is you're adding your two x-coordinates together from the two endpoints and dividing that sum by two, basically finding the average of the x-values, which would be the middle of the x-values, and then doing the same with your y-coordinates of your two endpoints. You'll add those together and then divide that sum by two. Again, finding the average of those y-coordinates, or the middle of the y-coordinates. So when you find the middle x-coordinate and the middle y-coordinate, you'll then have the coordinates of the midpoint. But first we need to know the coordinates of our endpoints. So this endpoint is at negative 1, 2, 3, 4 positive 1, 2, 3, 4. So these coordinates are negative 4, 4 for this endpoint. And this endpoint is at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, negative 2. These are my x1, y1, x2, y2 coordinates. And it doesn't matter which one you label as your x1, y1 as long as you label them consistently. For instance, this could not be my x2, y1. Since this is my x2 coordinate, that means this is my y2 coordinate. Those subscripts, the ones and the twos, all that means is this is the first point, this is the second point. But it really doesn't matter which point is your first and which point is your second. So I just usually label them from left to right. And now all we need to do is substitute and solve. So the midpoint is x1 plus x2, so negative 4 plus 6 divided by 2. And then y1 plus y2, 4 plus 6 
plus negative 2 divided by 2. Now we need to simplify by adding. Negative 4 plus 6 is 2 divided by 2. 4 plus negative 2 is 2 divided by 2. And finally, we divide. 2 divided by 2 is 1. 2 divided by 2 is 1. So the midpoint is 1, 1, which you can see on this graph over 1, up 1. And you know that point does look like it's right in the middle of that line. So that's our midpoint. Which of the following could be a graph of the function y equals 1 divided by x? Let's start with b. This is a linear function. In fact, it even looks like the parent function of a linear function, which is y equals x. So not y equals 1 divided by x. By the way, this is called a rational function. The root ratio means a comparison of two numbers or a fraction. And b is not the graph of a rational function. It's the graph of a linear function. c is a quadratic function graph. This parabola is graphed from a quadratic function. And this also looks like the parent form. The parent form of a quadratic function is y equals x squared. So this would also not be the graph of a rational function. On D, this is what an exponential function looks like. It starts out increasing slowly, but then it begins increasing faster. And that parent function is y equals a number to the x value, or b to the x. That's not the parent function, that's just the form. And it's actually y equals a times b to the x. But again, not a rational function. And then, so we can eliminate d. And then on e, this is very similar to b. It's another linear function. It graphs a line. And it's not the parent function this time, but it's still a linear function. So it's in this form, y equals mx plus b. So still, with a linear function, our x is not in the denominator like our rational function. So that one's out as well. Which means we're left with a, which is the graph of a rational function. Um, something you can think about with rational functions is that the only number you can't divide by is 0. Notice how on this graph your domain is never 0. On this side of our graph it's approaching 0 and then it turns down sharply away from 0 because your x value can never be 0 since you cannot divide by 0. It's the same thing in the first quadrant. Again, it's approaching 0 and then it turns sharply away from 0 because x can never be 0. Your y value will also never be 0. Um, so again, you can tell in this graph our y value never reaches 0. However, in all of these other graphs, we do have an x value of 0. There it is, right there. Right there, our x value of 0. And so that's another way to tell that a is the solution. a is the graph of the function y equals 1 divided by x. A sailboat is 19 meters long. What is its length in inches? There are many ways to approach this problem and solve it. The first thing I'm going to do is convert my meters into centimeters 
because then it's a quick conversion into inches from there. So I know that one meter is equal to 100 centimeters. And we can use a proportion to solve. We can take this conversion factor and use it, use it as a ratio. So one meter is 100 centimeters, which equals 19 meters is how many centimeters? And then to solve the proportion, we cross multiply. One times x is x, and 100 times 19 is 1900. So it's 1900 centimeters. Now I can use another proportion to solve for, or to find inches. I know that 2 and 54 hundredths centimeters is 1 inch, and I have 1900 centimeters, and I need to know how many inches that is. And again, to solve a proportion, we cross multiply. So 2 and 54 hundredths centimeters times x, 2 and 54 hundredths x is equal to 1 times 1900, which is 1900. And I forgot to put my little line up here, so I'll do that. And now we need to solve for x, which means dividing both sides by 2 and 54 hundredths. 2 and 54 hundredths divided by 2 and 54 hundredths is 1 times x is x, and that equals 1900 divided by 2 and 54 hundredths. So we need to do some division. Which means I have to move this decimal two places to the right. So I have to take my decimal 1900 and move it two places to the right which means adding two zeros. So now my number is 190,000 being divided by 254. So 254 does not go into 1 or into 19 or into 190, but it does go into 1900. And we can use compatible numbers here to get a very quick estimate of how many times it goes into 1900. So 254 is very close to 250. So 250, 500, 750, 1,000, 1,250, 1,500, 1,750, 1800. So it would, sorry, 1750 and then um, 2000. So it only goes seven times because 2000 is too much. So 254 only goes seven times into 1900. And we can see what that is right here. Seven times four is 28. Seven times five is 35. 36, 37. 7 times 2 is 14, plus 3 is 17. So it's 1,778. And then we subtract those, and we have to borrow from the 9, and that becomes an 8. So this is 10, and we borrow from the 10, it becomes a 9. This is 10. So 10 minus 8 is 2, 9 minus 7 is 2, and 8 minus 7 is 1, 122. So now we bring down our next zero. And again, we can use that 250 rule to see how many times it goes into 1,220. So 250, 500, 750, 1,000. And then it would be 1,250, but 1,250 is too much. So it only goes four times. So let's see, 254 times four. Four times four is 16, carry the one. 4 times 5 is 20, plus 1 is 21. 4 times 2 is 8, plus 2 is 10. So that's 1,016. And then we subtract. So we need to borrow from this 2. That becomes a 1. So this is 10 minus 6 is 4. 1 minus 1 is 0. And 2 minus 0 is 2. So that's 204. 
and then we bring down our zero here. So again, how many times does 250 go into 2040? So we have 250, 500, 750, 1,000. So four more times for 2,000. So it looks like a total of eight times. So let's see, let's check that. See where I have some room, we'll just do it up here. 254 times eight. Eight times four is 32. Eight times five is 40, plus three, 43. Eight times two is 16. 16 plus four is 20. So it's eight times is correct, and it's 2,032. We subtract and we get eight. And that would be our remainder. It'd be eight out of 254, or we could keep going to find our decimal. But if we look at our answers, we don't need to keep going because none of our answers have the decimal as part of it. So our answer is D, 748 inches. Arrange the following numbers in order from least to greatest. Two cubed, four squared, six to the zero power, nine, and 10 to the first. The first thing we need to do is simplify these numbers. Two cubed means two times itself three times. So that's two times two times two. Two times two is four, times two is eight. So that is eight, four squared, is four times itself two times. Four times four is 16. Now this next one is very interesting because it doesn't matter what this number is. The base number doesn't matter. Any number raised to the zero power is always one. Nine, of course, is simply nine and 10 to the first is 10 times itself, one time, or not really 10 times itself at all, it's just 10. You're not multiplying 10 by anything else because you just have 10 written one time. And now they want these numbers in order from least to greatest. So the smallest number would be one, followed by eight, then nine, 10, and 16. But of course, those are not in our answer choices because the numbers are written as they originally were. So now I'm gonna go back and write them the way they were written to begin with. One was six to the zero. Eight was two cubed. Nine was always nine. 10 was from 10 to the first, and 16 was four squared. And now we just need to find which answer choice has this as the answer. So of course we should be starting with six to the zero, so that takes it down to either B or D. But then the next should be two cubed, which is not the case for B, so our answer is D. Which of the following expressions is equivalent to x cubed times x to the fifth? First of all, we need to recognize that when you have two letters or a number in a letter next to each other with no operation symbols in between them, meaning there's no addition sign, subtraction, division, it is always understood that without any of those other operation signs that we are multiplying these together. So this is x cubed times x to the fifth. And an exponent simply tells you how many times to multiply the base times itself. So x cubed means we're multiplying x times itself three times. 
And then we're multiplying that times x to the fifth, which is x times itself five times. So really, we're multiplying x times itself a total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 times. So x cubed times x to the fifth is the same as x to the eighth. Now there is a rule for this so that you don't have to go through this step every time. And the rule is when you multiply with the same bases, the base being, like in this case, x. Then you simply add the exponents together. So 3 plus 5 is 8, so it's x to the 8th, which is answer choice D. Jesse invests $7,000 in a certificate of deposit that pays interest at the rate of 7.5% annually. How much interest in dollars does Jesse gain from this investment during the first year that he holds the certificate? This is a great problem to use this formula on. And some people call it IPERT, just as a way to remember it. The I stands for the interest, the amount of interest in dollars, like what we're trying to find. P stands for principal, or the amount that's being invested initially. That would be our $7,000. The R is the rate, or the percentage, but written as a decimal. So we're going to take 7.5% and write it as a decimal, and that'll be our rate. And then T stands for time. So you may want to make a note of that. This I is the interest. P is the principal. R is the rate as a decimal. And the T is the time. So we're going to take our information from our problem and plug it in. So our amount of interest is equal to the principal, $7,000, times the rate as a decimal again. So we're taking 7.5% and changing it to a decimal, which means taking the decimal and moving it two places to the left. So you add that zero, so it's... 75 thousandths, and then times the year, or the time, and um, we're just trying to find out about the first year, so that means it's been in there for one year, and then we just need to multiply those things together. So one times anything is just that, so I can really kind of ignore that, so I just need to multiply these two numbers together, so I have this 75 thousandths, and I'm going to put it on top because it's very easy to multiply times 7,000 since the first thing I'm going to do is just write down those three zeros. And then the only number I really have to multiply by is the 7. So the 7 times 5 is 35, write the 5, carry the 3. 7 times 7 is 49, plus 3 is 52. And then we have three numbers behind the decimal, so three numbers behind the decimal. And that means that he's going to make $525 off of his investment. So that's the number you would need to bubble in is 525. Pradeep decides to invest $4,500 in Cisco system stock and buys it at the price shown in the table. At what price should he sell it to obtain a profit of 10%? So he's buying Cisco system stock at $3.50 per share. If he wants to make a profit of 10%, then he needs to sell his stock when the price per share is 10% higher. 
And there are several ways to solve this problem. I'll show you one. So first I want to know, what is 10% of $3.50? Well, of means to multiply. So I'm multiplying times one-tenth, or times ten-hundredths. And multiplying times ten-hundredths means just moving that decimal one place to the left. So that is thirty-five hundredths, or thirty-five cents. So that means that his stock needs to be thirty-five cents higher. The price per share needs to be thirty-five cents greater. So $3.50 plus 35 cents is $3.85. So in order to make a profit, a 10% profit, then he needs to sell his stock at $3.85 per share. The Charleston Recycling Company collects 50,000 tons of recyclable material every month. The chart shows the kinds of materials that are collected by the company's five trucks. Approximately how much paper is recycled every month? This pie chart is a total of 100%. And it's a total 100% of 50,000 tons. So this 40% means 40% of the total. Paper is 40%. So 40% of 40 the total amount of recyclable material collected, or 50,000 tons, 40% of that is paper. And that's what we want to find is how much is that? Well, of means to multiply. And I'm going to multiply 40% and 50,000, which means I need to change 40% to a decimal. So move the decimal two places to the left. So I'm actually multiplying 4 tenths or 40 hundredths, it's the same thing, times 50,000. So we have 50,000 times 4 tenths. 4 times 0 is 0, 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 and 4 times 5 is 20. We have one number behind the decimal, so our answer should have one number behind the decimal, and we get 20,000 tons. So 20,000 tons of the total 50,000 tons of recyclable material is paper. The diagram shows the outline of a racetrack for skaters, which consists of two long straight sections and two semicircular turns. Given the dimensions shown, which of the following most closely measures the perimeter of the entire track? Well, they've given us that this length here is 150 yards, apparently, since all of our answers are in yards. So that means that this opposite straight side here would also be 150 yards. And actually, just from that amount of information, we can already start eliminating some answers. I know that 180 yards is definitely not enough, because I've got 150 and 150. So we're going to have to skate this 150, skate some more, skate another 150, and skate some more. So we know we're already over 180 yards. We also know it's going to be more than 300 yards, because just the two straight sections are 300 yards, so we can already eliminate that answer choice. And we're down to these three possibilities. So that means we need to figure out what this distance is here and here. 
They told us that these were semicircular turns. That means that semi, that semi means half of a circle. So if you take these two halves of a circle and you put them together, you get one whole circle. So really they're traveling the distance of one whole circle in addition to these straight sides here, which means we need to find the circumference of our circle to find the distance around the circle. That's what circumference is. And the circumference of a circle is pi times the diameter of the circle, which they gave us. They told us that this distance is 30. Well, that goes all the way across my circle. So that's my diameter. So my circumference is 30 pi. And pi is about 3. It's actually a little over 3. But since they said most closely measures, we'd probably be okay just using 3 for pi. So our circumference is about 90 yards. Um, plus, we have these straight sides. So the total distance around the racetrack would be the 150 yards plus 150 yards for our two straight sides, plus the about 90 for these two curved sides, the semicircular, which is 390 yards. Now, if you'll remember, we rounded pi down. It's actually over three. We rounded it down to three. So really our answer is a little bit higher than 390, which is answer choice D, 395 yards. Mrs. Patterson's classroom has 16 empty chairs. All the chairs are occupied when every student is present. If two-fifths of the students are absent, how many students make up her entire class? This is a great problem to use a proportion to solve. We can take this fraction, two-fifths, and use that as our first ratio. Two being the amount of students who are absent out of the five total. And that equals Again, number of students who are absent divided by the total. And it says in the problem that there are 16 empty chairs, which means there are 16 students missing since usually all the chairs are occupied when every student is present. So every empty chair is a student who's absent. So we have 16 absent students out of, and this is what we don't know. What's the total? How many students make up her entire class? And to solve a proportion, we simply need to cross multiply. 2 times x is 2x, and that equals 16 times 5, which is 80. And then we solve for x by dividing both sides by 2. And x equals 40. So that means there are 40 students in her entire class. Which of the following expressions is equivalent to the quantity a plus b times the quantity a minus b? Well, this is actually a rule that you would memorize, but you don't have to memorize it. You can always just take these binomials and multiply them together using FOIL. The F stands for first, meaning to multiply the first terms in each set of parentheses. So A times A. And A times A is A squared. Then O stands for outer or outside. So you multiply the two terms on the outsides, or a and negative b. So a times negative b 
is negative AB. I stands for inner or inside. So you multiply the two terms on the inside, B and A. B times A is BA or AB, so plus AB. And finally, the L stands for last. So you multiply the two terms that are in the last positions of each set of parentheses. Positive B times negative B, which is negative B squared. Then to simplify, we combine like terms. Negative AB and positive AB are like terms. And they cancel each other out because they're additive inverses of each other, or opposites. So we're left with a squared minus b squared, or answer a. In the figure, a, b, and c are points on the number line, where o is the origin. What is the ratio of the distance BC to the distance AB? So first we need to find the distance between points B and C. And the distance between two points is the absolute value of the difference of the coordinates. So that is the absolute value of B is 5, minus C is 8, which is the absolute value of negative 3, and that is 3. So the distance between points B and C is 3. Now we're going to do the same thing to find the distance for, between points A and B. And again, it's the absolute value of the difference of the coordinates of point A and point B. So that's the absolute value of A is negative 6 minus B is 5, which is the absolute value of negative 6 minus 5 is negative 11, and that is 11. So the distance from point A to point B is 11. Now they've asked us what the ratio of those distances is. And it gives you the order that it wants the ratio written in. So the distance BC should be the first number in the ratio, 3, 2, and a, we use a colon or you can write 2, it's fine too. The distance from points A to B, which is 11. So our ratio is 3 to 11, or answer D. There are 64 squares on a checkerboard. Bobby puts one penny on the first square, two on the second square, four on the third, eight on the fourth, and continues to double the number of coins at each square until he has covered all 64 squares. How many coins must he place upon the last square? The first thing I want to do is take this information out and organize it. So I've got two pieces of information here. I've got these number of squares and also how many coins are on the squares. So I'm going to organize it as squares and number of coins. So it says he puts one penny on the first square. So square one, one penny. Two on the second square. Second square, two pennies. Four pennies on the third square. So third square, four pennies. 8 on the 4th square, so 4th square, 8 pennies, and so on like that. It keeps doubling. So another important word here is double. Really, we don't even have to find the pattern. 
they told us what it was. We're doubling. So this is 1 times 2 is 2, times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8. So since I know I'm doubling, then I have a base of 2. So on the first square, I have 2 to the power of 0. Any number to 0 is 1. So on my first square, I have 2 to the power of 0 coins. On my second square, I have 2 to the first power coins. 2 to the first power is 2. On my third square, I have 2 squared coins. 2 squared is 4. On the fourth square, I have 2 cubed coins. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. So as you can see, as we increase our number of squares, our exponent also increases. The first square had 2 to the power of 0 coins. So the exponent is 1 less than the square that we're on. Second square, 2 to the first power, the exponent is 1 less than the square we're on. Third square, 2 to the second power, the exponent is 1 less than the square we're on, and so on and so forth. So then how many pennies will be on the 64th square? Well, we know that our x, we're going to have a base of 2 and our exponent is going to be 1 less than the square we're on. So we'd have 2 to the 63rd power number of coins on our 64th square. Just answer C. In an election in Kimball County, candidate A obtained 36,800 votes. His opponent, candidate B, obtained 32,100 votes. 2,100 votes went to write-in candidates. What percentage of the votes went to candidate A? To find a percent, we need the part over the whole. And we know the part. The part is the number of votes candidate A received, which is 36,800. What I need to know is the whole, or the total number of votes. To find the total number of votes, we need to add up 36,800, 32,100, and 2,100 so that we can find the total. So we're adding, those are 0, and again we get 0. Then we have 8, 9, 10, so that's a 0, carry the 1. We have 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, carry the 1, and we have 3, 6, 7. So that means there were a total of 71,000 votes. Now to find our percent, we need to divide. And that'll give us our decimal, which will then change into a percent. But before I divide, I'm going to first simplify this fraction by canceling two zeros. And now my division will be a lot easier. So we need to divide 368 by 710. Well, 710 doesn't go into 368 at all, which means I'm going to have to add a decimal and a zero. And now I can divide 710 into 3,680. So I can use compatible numbers here, and 710 is very close to 700. 700 times 5 would be 3,500. So I'm thinking 710 is going to go about 5 times into 3,680. So let me multiply this, we get 0, and that's 5, and that's 35. So 3,550. Yep, looks good. 
So that's five, we have 3,550. Now we need to subtract, and that's zero, three, one, so 130. Then we need to add a zero and bring it down. 1,300, so 710, and um, it's only gonna go into 1,300 one time, because 700 plus 700 would be 1,400, and that's too much, so it's just one time. 710 times one is 710. Then we need to subtract. So I'm gonna borrow from the one, that's a zero, that's 13, borrow from the 13, that's 12, which makes that 10. And we'll borrow, well, we don't need to borrow that zero, so 10 minus one is nine, and 12 minus seven is five, 590. Which makes sense, if you add 90 back to 710, you get 800. And if you add 500 to 800, you get the 1300. So we need to add another zero and bring it down. So now we need to know how many times 710 goes into 5,900. So I'm again going to use that compatible number of 700. So let's see, 700 times um, eight would be 5,600. So I'm thinking it goes in there about eight times. So that's zero and that's eight and that's 56. So yes, that's very close, so that's eight. And we have 5680. We can subtract, and that's zero. Borrow from the nine, that's an eight, so that's 10. 10 minus eight is two, eight minus six is two, so we get 220. And we could keep going, but really, that's all I need to know, because as I look at my answers, it's very clear which one of these is my answer. This is, well, it's about 518 thousandths, and then when we change it into our percent, we move our decimal two places to the right, we get 51 and 8 tenths percent, which is answer A. If x plus y is greater than zero, when x is greater than y, which of the following cannot be true? This word when is very important because it means we're only looking at the situations when x is greater than y. So first we should go through our answers and eliminate the ones that don't satisfy this inequality. Is three greater than zero? Yes. So it states, six is greater than negative one. So it stays. Negative three is not greater than zero, which means C must be eliminated as a choice. Negative four is not greater than negative three, so it must also be eliminated as a choice. Three is greater than negative three. So the three answers left are the only ones that satisfy this inequality. So now we need to check to see if they satisfy the first. So we'll take a, three plus zero is greater than zero, three plus zero is three, and that is greater than zero, so it works. B, six plus negative one is greater than zero. Six plus negative one is five, and five is greater than zero. And finally, E. Three plus negative three is greater than zero. Three plus negative three is zero. But zero is not greater than zero. Zero is simply equal to zero. So this one is not true. So we found our answer, E. Elijah drove 45 miles to his job in an hour and 10 minutes in the morning. On the way home, however, traffic was much heavier, and the same trip took
took an hour and a half. What was his average speed in miles per hour for the round trip? So first let's determine just how far Elijah went. It was 45 miles to his job and then he had to drive 45 miles back home. So he drove that 45 miles twice or 90 miles. Speed is calculated by dividing your distance by your time. So we've got his total distance. Now we need to find his total time. It says it took him an hour and 10 minutes to get to his job. So one hour and 10 minutes is a total of 60 minutes plus 10 minutes, 70 minutes. Then on the way home, it took him an hour and a half. So one hour, 30 minutes. Again, an hour, 60 minutes plus 30 minutes means a total of 90 minutes. And we convert it, I'm converting the time into minutes just because it makes those units easier to work with. When you've got hours and minutes together, it's easier just to bring them all into minutes, put them all in that same unit of minutes. So 70 plus 90 is 160 minutes for his total travel time. So again, to calculate his speed, we need to divide his total distance by his total time. So 90 miles divided by 160 minutes. Well, the first thing I could do to simplify this is I could cancel a zero. So now it's just nine divided by 16, which will be a lot easier to work with. So I have nine divided by 16. 16 doesn't go into 9 at all. That's 0, which means I'm going to need to add a decimal and a 0. 16 goes into 90 five times. So 16 times 5, 5 times 6 is 30. Carry the 3. 5 times 1 is 5 plus 3 is 8, so that's 80. We subtract and we get 10. So we need to add another 0 and bring it down. So 16 goes into 100 six times. Since it went into 16 times 5 was 80, then one more time would be 96. And then we subtract and we get 4. Add another zero, bring it down. 16 goes into 40 two times. 16 times two is 32. So we subtract and we get eight. Add another zero, bring it down. And 16 goes into 80 five times. 16 times five is 80. We subtract and get zero. So that means that his speed in miles per minute would be 0.5625. But they didn't ask us for his speed in miles per minute. They asked us for his average speed in miles per hour. So now I have to convert this speed into miles per hour by multiplying it by 60, since there are 60 minutes in one hour. So if he travels this speed every minute, then we multiply by 60 to find the speed in miles per hour. So first start with your zero placeholder. Six times five is 30, so that's zero, carry the three. Six times two is 12, plus three is 15. Six times Put that in the wrong place, oops. Six times six is 36, plus one is seven. Carry the three. Six times five is 30, plus three is 33. 
and we have one, two, three, four numbers behind the decimal. So your answer should have four numbers behind the decimal. So it's 33 and 75 hundredths miles per hour, which is the same as 33 and 3 fourths miles per hour, since 3 fourths and 75 hundredths are equal. The table shows the cost of renting a bicycle for one, two, or three hours. Which of the following equations best represents the data? If C represents the cost and H represents the time of rental. Since this is a multiple choice question, you could always substitute these values or substitute these values for hours into your equation and see if you get the cost. For instance, you could replace H with 1 and you have 360 or $3.60 times 1, which is 360, which is the cost for one hour. And then do the same with 2 and with 3. Because sometimes an equation will work for one set of data, but not for the other two. So you should test it on all of them. However, I'll show you how to solve this problem if it weren't multiple choice. So we're going to write our own function rule using the data. First, looking at hours and cost, your cost is dependent on the number of hours you rent the bike. Cost, then, is the dependent variable. And I want to focus on my dependent variable and see what kind of changes are happening. So from $3.60 to $7.20, I'm adding $3.60. From $7.20 to $10.80, I'm again adding $3.60. So I can see that the change in Y is constant, or the change in the cost in the dependent variable is constant. I want to now compare and see what's happening with my independent variable, my time. So from 1 to 2, I increase by 1. From 2 to 3, I also increase by 1. So there's a constant change in my independent, my time, as well. This tells me that there's a linear relationship here. So to write my function rule, I simply need to find my rate of change which is the change in y divided by the change in x. And the y, that's the dependent variable, whereas x is the independent variable. And we've already established that our cost is dependent, therefore our cost is our y. And we've already found the change in y, it's $3.60 divided by the change in x, 1. So our rate of change is simply $3.60. And that rate of change is what you're multiplying the independent variable by to get the dependent variable. So I've now found that the cost is equal to $3.60 times my independent variable of h. And then we can check and see if it works. So let's replace h with 1. $3.60 times 1 is $3.60. Try it with 2. $3.60 times 2 is $7.20. Finally, 3. 
$3.60 times 3 is $10.80. So that verifies that our function rule works for this situation and is correct. So answer A. Which of the following is a solution to the inequality 4x minus 12 is less than 4? First, we should solve for x in this inequality. So we're going to add 12 to both sides, bring down our 4x, minus 12 plus 12 is 0, so that cancels, bring down our less than sign, and 4 plus 12 is 16. Then we need to divide both sides by 4. 4 divided by 4 is 1, times x is x, is less than 16 divided by 4 is 4. Keep in mind when solving inequalities that if you multiply or divide both sides by a negative number, you must flip the inequality symbol. In this case, we didn't have to since we didn't divide both sides by a negative number. It's all about that negative. So now we can apply these answer choices. We want to find which one of these numbers is less than 4. Is 7 less than 4? No. Is 6 less than 4? No. Is 5 less than 4? No. What about 4? Is 4 less than 4? No. If this were a less than or equal to sign, if it said x is less than or equal to 4, then yes, 4 would be a solution because 4 is equal to 4. And it only has to be 1, either less than or equal to. But in this case, it's not a less than or equal to sign. It's simply a less than sign, meaning that this number must be smaller than 4. So, our answer is E. 3 is less than 4, where 3 is a smaller number than 4.